Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome, and I hope you're having a good morning. Um, I'd like to start off by introducing you to um, Lux Executive Editor, Brittany Chevalier McIntyre. She will then introduce you to our panelists um, for, our, um, for our intersection for art and design. Thank you so much, Beth. Hello, my name is Brittany Chevalier McIntyre, and I'm the executive editor at Lux Interiors and Design Magazine. Thank you all so much for joining us for the Decoration and Design Building's Reconnections Virtual Market. Today's discussion is all about the intersection of art and design. With these three distinguished panelists, we will be exploring the importance of art and its impact on interior design, including the integration of original artwork in stunning home design and how emerging artists are often incorporated into interior collections. For example, like Zoffany's newest collection, Kensington Walk. Also, there will be a Q&A at the end of this session. So feel free to ask questions in the Q&A box on the bottom of your Zoom at the end of the session. So while our panelists need no introduction, Peter Gomez joined Zoffany in 2006 and took over as design manager in 2014. Having studied screen printing in London, his core skills are working with print, working with machinery, and working with designers in creating new designs from processes. Blair Volts Clark founded Volts Clark in 2002 and saw immediate success with the pop-up formula as executed with her first exhibition in an elegant townhouse in uptown Manhattan. She opened her flagship gallery in the fall of 2015 and has continued her curatorial signature of presenting emerging talent to sophisticated audiences in unexpected venues. Elena Frampton founded Frampton Co. in 2015, following nearly two decades at the helm of a successful bi-coastal design practice and honing her craft working at some of New York's most prestigious interior design firms. Her knack for clever solutions that strike a balance between pragmatism and personality draws even the most cautious of clients into her process. So thank you all for being here, panelists. Um, we are here to discuss this really interesting and artistic topic, and we so appreciate you being here. So you know what? Let's dive right into it. Peter, I want to talk to you about Zoffany's newest collection, Kensington Walk. This collection is really inspired by all corners of West London and has a sense of escapism. Collaborating with a Royal College of Art alum, Sam Wilde, that you've worked with before, I want to know, how did this collaboration come about and what was the initial inspiration? Um, well, with this, Zoffany has a close relationship with the Royal College for a number of years. Um, and I, I do take it upon myself to um, connect with um, graduates, especially at the final degree show. Um, we're formalizing our relationship a bit more recently. We're actually sponsoring a student um, this year for the first time. Um, but I met Sam um, at his final degree show, uh, his master's show. Um, and it was where I was really inspired by him as the person, actually. He's um, an incredible um, artist. Um, he has a really unique history on how he came into the art world. Um, so he studied um, actual animal um, preservation and ecology, and um, then joined the Royal College of Art later. Um, so his early works very much revolve around um, bringing awareness to animal endangerment. Um, so I, I started to work with him very early on with a Palladio collection, which supports young artists. And um, at that stage, we always get to see their whole portfolio. And what he was really showing as what was his look uh, was very particular. But through looking at his portfolio, there were some really beautiful drawings and such um, fine detail and integrity on some of his work. So I wanted to explore that further. So I commissioned this design, um, Eastern Palace, um, for our Zoffany collection. So we've been working for probably about three years together. So this collaboration, when did it really begin? When did you start it? Not three years ago, but you really started No, 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 no. So the very first design with Sam, which was the Palladio, was probably about three years ago. This okay. design um, was about, 
I'd say with lockdown and everything, it's probably about a year and a half um, ago we we started this conversation. Um, so um, so yeah, so it's taken a while for the design to evolve. Um, Sam works in a very different way to all our other artists. He um, really embodies modern technology. So it's the first time I've worked with an artist who solely draws on the computer, mm-hmm. um, which was a really interesting learning curve for me. Um, and it was something that we really wanted to explore, having something drawn so beautifully, but and have all the intricacies of a hand-drawn element, but created in a very contemporary way. So it's how was it? How was it working on this collection during lockdown? Um, it was interesting. Uh, it evolved because of lockdown, which was quite interesting. A lot of the designs. Um, the ones which resonated at the end of lockdown were the ones which were very much inspired by the outdoors. Um, mm-hmm. And we had worked quite up a few designs. It's very fluid the way we tend to work in the studio. So um, really it probably was in the curation of the collection where it's most evident the effect of lockdown. And it was trying to bring more of the outside in, brighter, cleaner colors and just connecting with nature far more. So you're really a champion of emerging talent. Tell me about the varying perspectives that these fresh creatives bring to the world of Zophany. um, I I think it's amazing how we need to be um, very true to our our history as a brand and our knowledge of our documents and our heritage. And that's really what we bring to the table. Um, What we're looking for when we collaborate with, especially young designers, is um, this fresh look on what we do, Um, a reinterpretation of our our, our DNA in a way. So they're they're reinterpreting the documents, they're looking at everything through fresh eyes, and then it's a conversation with ourselves in imparting the knowledge we have to them. Um, Technology is moving so quickly, um, and there's the, the overlaying of um how we produce things to how we did in the past to how we do today so um i studied screen print we rely on digital printing quite heavily now um and so the skills that the students are coming out with are more digitally minded um i'm fascinated with 3d printing um never tried it in my life but the the students are are understanding all these new applications which we could then incorporate into our own product. So in a way they're they're teaching you a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you do need to be open. It needs to be a conversation between both of us and to work together. Otherwise we will never develop and we'll never be we'll never remain current. Absolutely. Both ends are teaching each other. I mm. think that's amazing. So speaking of emerging talents, Blair. You work primarily with emerging talent. However, you were explaining when we were speaking a week or two ago, um, the terminology of emerging really needs to be reworked. Tell me about that. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, As we all think about identity more than ever now, I think we had a lot of time during lockdown to think, you know, reflect and look inside and think, where am I going? Where have I been? So when we started, or I, it was all me by myself in 2003, um, this business of gathering artists around me that I felt so passionate about and had such a true um, belief in, they were all incredibly young. And this has a lot to do with age that um, I love when Zofni is talking so much about working with all or so much emerging talent, I tend to think the emerging is a lot younger. And as I have aged along the process, so many of our artists have aged right along with me because they were literally arm and arm and arm and arm and arm with me our course until now 21. So I think to call a late 40 year old painter or an early 50, even early 60, an emerging artist. It's kind of funny and it's amusing. I think they'd be rather flattered, (laughs) but in all honesty, they've been doing it for so long and they've developed their practice. They've continued with bodies of work that have been successful. They've been in many, many solo shows, had some museum, 
you know, dipping their toes in some museums in wonderful collections. So to call them an emerging artist, it's a little bit of an identity crisis. <laughs> So while we have so many new young emerging artists coming into the program, we now have moved and we call our tried and true a little bit older. We've moved them to the mid-career status, if you will. And honestly, not that we're trying to label or put anyone in a box, but I do think they'd be flattered, but sometimes they think, well, gosh, I've been doing this a long time. Emerging fully speaks to still developing their practice, still coming up with ideas, still deciding, are they gonna be a sculptor? Are they gonna be a neon, um, you know, on the ceiling um, installation-based creator? And now we're gonna to get to a little bit later in the conversation, the blurred lines of not having to identify as one or the other, being a lot of the above. But um, I do think it's important when you as um, an art enthusiast or on the other side of the gallery spectrum as a client to think about going into all different styles of galleries and look for the emerging artist in a gallery, look for the mid-career, and then throw in some dead artists. Why not? Um, silence my phone here. Um, once you get all of those on a wall and you're living with them, there's such a nice blend and a dialogue between those three. How does the mid-career feel different when you put something just brand new and fresh and, and positive? That mid-career is kind of, yes, they might change and evolve over time, but you know their style, you recognize it that might not be the case so much with emerging artists. So it blends nicely. And then you throw in um, one example I was thinking the other day was Kenneth Nolan. He's an artist that is dead. He's underground now, but um, so many uh, painters from the minimalist period look to him to set that tone of simplicity and power in just a few lines. So when you put an emerging artist that is inspired by Kenneth Nolan next to Kenneth Nolan. We happen to own a couple of Kenneth Nolans and that causes such a neat conversation. It's like a little dinner party in your house. So long-winded answer by saying, I am thrilled and honored to say we only work with emerging artists, but when you really dive and dig deeper, it's quite a spectrum when you get to be my age. So you're really <laughs> representing so a whole really breath. representing a whole breath. Absolutely. And that's just because honestly, I'm nearing 50 at 49. I just turned 49. You've been doing it so long that it would, um, I wouldn't have been a success, I feel like in this field, if I had just stayed and not um, continued with the artists that were emerging to move through and with their career, to welcome them into um, that mid-career status. So Elena, as a designer who uses all, you use textiles, wall coverings, and artwork in your designs. Do you work with emerging talents in all of these sectors? And if so, where are you finding them in this current climate? Sure, thanks so much for having me, by the way. <laughs> thank, you. Um, thank you to Lux. Um, I think that we are using all kinds of artwork um, and we're layering it within our spaces. And for us, we're driven by the notion of living with art. Um, and that's not necessarily in a residential setting. It could be a hospitality setting or a corporate setting, but the idea is living with art. And so with us, it's very much a project basis and a client basis in terms of whether we're incorporating young talents, um, more established artists, and what kind of work we're looking for in terms of injecting a certain what I would describe as like spirit into our spaces. Um, in terms of how to find talent, um, that's just good old fashioned research. Um, and it has certainly changed over time, but I really just spent about, you know, 20 years or so just constantly researching the marketplace and scouting talent. And I've sort of always sort of done studio visits and I've always done very, um, proactive research on a constant basis such that I'm ready to roll when a certain client comes to me and I need to make that match. I've already um, done the years of research. I've already done the studio visit. I've already, you know, I know what's available. I've already had um, galleries and dealers reach out to me and say, I've, you know, just met this artist or we've just landed this estate. Please come and 
you know, come to the back and see what we have. So when a client comes, I'm already prepared and ready to go. Amazing. I mean, this is actually a question both for Elena and for Blair. I know that Peter was speaking about this collaboration mentality that you're kind of each teaching each other something. Is that something that you are both finding in your in your work um, as an interior designer and then as a gallerist? So Elena, are, you can start with that question. In terms of teaching each other? Like you're learning something okay. from right. them and something oh. that something or a medium that you're seeing more and more in the world of art that you weren't sure. seeing before, let's say prior to lockdown. I think that the, the notion of collaboration is certainly, you know, long in history, especially with all of my fellow interior designers that are viewing today. Um, we are collaborating with artisans, we are collaborating with builders, we are collaborating with clients, and then certainly with the intersection of the art world, we're collaborating with all the different facets of the art world too. Um, so I think that there's certainly a level of education and that might come from, you know, someone like Blair sharing with me someone that they've discovered. And then there's a whole um, sort of um, energy where then it also goes from me sharing with a client. Um, and then how does that whole process work? So it's very much a um, about relationships and, I think also the sense of discovery. Um, and I think that there's a wonderful energy in that sense of discovery um, and a, certainly a lot of collaboration. I love the idea of everything you said that we're learning from one another as we go along. And um, Elena, I had I loved diving into your site. And I think what you've done so beautifully is honor the artist. You can tell that so many of your projects, it almost looks like the artwork was the catalyst, the very starting point, which um, is our top favorite scenario. Um, have we ever seen the fabric? I need blue, I need green, I need yellow in a painting. I'm not gonna lie that I don't hear that sometimes. If I if any gallery told you that that didn't exist, they would be lying and they'd have their um, <laughs> fingers crossed behind them. But um, at the end of the day, it's always a struggle. I think people, um, they won't admit that they would like to live harmoniously with their art and live pleasantly and heaven forbid, don't have it match because we don't want matchy matchy. That's never the goal, but there's, there's nothing wrong with something if a piece happens to be green and your whole room is a beautiful deep dark green and you just love the way that works together. That's beautiful and that's honoring the artist so gracefully. I'm, I love when someone comes in and they say, you know, it's just nice to be at Vaults Clark because you do recognize beautiful things and we're not trying to put ugly art on the wall and ugly art can be wonderful too it can create a reaction and, and we have some art that is very dark and uh introspective and, and you know makes you think and conceptual but a little bit back to kind of going to the emerging mid-career and dead artists a little bit for everyone i think is a nice balance but i love what elena is doing that you can tell the art truly almost runs the show in a very honorable, wonderful way where it's not that afterthought. It's not that little bit of an icing on the cake. So to have that integrity, it didn't happen yesterday. It's a long history of these relationships with studio visits, galleries, you know, as you're saying. And then one more um, note to that is we're seeing in the past more five years, but really in the last sort of 18 months, this love and yearning for bringing an installation artist into the home where before no one wanted to drop a sort of um, mobile from the ceiling. No one would ever dream of putting 150 holes in their walls in the ceiling or in an unexpected place. Now I feel like people are curating and I know that's another buzzword. There's so many buzzwords collaborating, curating, um, but they're curating their homes literally as if it was a wing at the Met. But why not? That's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Why not? Brittany, I love that because people are living in their spaces more. So they want that. Absolutely. Yeah. Brittany, one more thing I wanted to mention, and I think this, this just goes back to Blair's comment about the thinking about textiles and color and relative mm -hmm. to the art. And 
you know, kudos to Peter and, and Zofany for creating wonderful prints and patterns because the home textile market needs to catch up with the fashion market. And so yeah. I'm so excited to explore your collections. And I, I think that the idea of um, this sort of white box space that art needs to be viewed in a white box is something that yeah. we're very eager to challenge. And that's what yeah. I, that's what I, I love to challenge that because I think that we fully get the benefits of art when it is um, installed in a way that's personal to us. And so Absolutely. I know a lot of my clients, you know, go to spaces and, and maybe that's where I fit in is that I'm able to contextualize how to, how to live with the work. Um, but I love the idea of layering a painting on top of that background right there. I mean, that's what's exciting to me is challenging sort of the old, the old conventions of how we're supposed to look at it and how we're supposed to experience it. Yes. Well, Elena, you read my mind. I was literally going to go in that direction. So I was going to ask Peter. So of course, this idea of incorporating art upon art, the, you know, the textiles and wall coverings that Zofany creates are very much pieces of artwork since they are transcribed from actual works by artists. So you incorporate so many different styles, Peter, within the brand. However, you always keep artistry of creation and handwork that goes into each of your SKUs front and center. So how do you balance the range of artistic categories without losing the authenticity of the brand's ethos? Um, we're very fortunate that, that artistry is very much interwoven into our ethos. So it's almost a starting point for everything we do. Um, one of the points which was touched on earlier was um, how um, art and craft and artistry and creation um, is so broad. So um, we, we're really fortunate to work with um, master craftsmen in the, all around the world in creating our product. So sometimes the artistry I find most um, resonating is actually the creation of a hand embroidery and the years of tradition which has gone into that and that individual craftsperson who has created this. So as a brand, we not only produce uh, work, collaborate with artists, we work with craftspeople and it's knowing the provenance of all of them and being able to share each individual design story but obviously as a brand we also incorporate planes and textures to highlight all these things and color is so pivotal in in how we design um, i resonate really well with designers who um, have a, an amazing color sense and work with color in a completely different way even though when it comes to a figurative form of art but it's not their strength and that's fine because we all pitch in and we we all do our things and then what my my flat itself is completely filled of everything that i've not wanted to part with be it a a, a hand embroidery which was never produced but i know it took 25 hours 25 people to do one meter um and then equally i have artwork and i think just because my aesthetic is my aesthetic I love it. It's probably not for everyone's cup of tea, and it is pattern on pattern. Um, I think, I think for me, art is very personal, and it's how I want to feel when I am at home, and what makes me um, wonder my eye across my living room wall and and connect with all the different artwork that I've collect, collected over the years. And I hold the same reverence to those as to that embroidery. Um, so. For me personally, I love the layered artistry. As a brand, I, I know it's very important to be able to offer these um, varieties of textures and these varieties of levels of design to allow other people to curate their own home and their own sort of environments and whether they want something as mental as my house or they want something a bit more sedate. But, um, they need, they, it needs to be personal to the person who's gonna be living there and, and working with interior designers who work really closely with their clients. I, I find it amazing how it's through communication and bringing out that what the client wants. So um, 
I have a quick question to jump in for you, Peter, to interrupt. Um, first of all, what you're doing with artists, it's the holy grail because you're treating them like Elena, you know, with just so much respect. It's, it, it, they've won the lottery when they cross your path. And what's <laughs> often he's doing is just elevating. I mean, it's really sensational. However, playing devil's advocate, I'm very curious if um, you've ever gotten down the path and think there's going to be this great um, duet between you and an artist and it goes wrong. And they think, oh. you know what, this thing isn't for me, let's lump it. <laughs> Cause I wanna hear the good, the bad and the other. <laughs> um, well, actually you always, have to work with personalities and not not everything oh, yeah. <laughs> gels and I think the difficulty is um, I'm restrained within myself because I work for a brand so it needs to be right for a much wider um, instance so there have been occasions that we've gone probably we've never taken it to the ninth degree where we've had to drop it at the end um, sure. I think you, you can really tell how I especially just working creatively with other people, it, it, it's almost infectious how you start to cr go down a path. And I never really have an end goal, <laughs> sounds awful, but I, I, I have an end goal, but the, I, I love to be taken to another direction. And if you feel the journey is not happening, then it's better for both of us to be honest and to actually just say, this is not, I'm, I'm very happy as well. It's like a relationship, a marriage. It is. It's it definitely. Is. And I'm very happy as well within myself to, um, if I'm not the right person to collaborate with them, mm -hmm. but I know who is. Um, I'm a yes. huge believer in connecting people and making sure that they're paired correctly rather than forcing Absolutely. something to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Elena, can you speak to a space and when you're designing, where are the boundaries, especially when it comes to design versus decorative and also this, this idea of art upon art? So I think um, the design versus decorative versus art versus craft versus um, beauty and construction, all of that, I, I'm really interested in um, sort of illustrating a vision and providing a service to my client. So whatever sort of boundaries there are between all those really start to disappear. Um, I think when we're speaking about art, um, there is the sort of selecting works based on loving and living with, and then there is selecting for the purposes of investing. So those are two different worlds. I'm in the world and my business and my practice is in the world of loving and living with. And so when I meet with a client for the first time, and I don't even know if I have the commission yet, I, we meet for the first time within the first two to three minutes. And I know it sounds very mystical, but within the first few minutes, I have visions of artistry. And that could be artworks, it could be textile color palettes, it could be um, a construction detail. Um, I, it's, it's like this, um, I don't know, it's just a very mystical thing and it happens very quickly where I have visions for all of those different elements. And then as we um, obtain the commission as, and as we start the standard design process, our integration of art is in the same alignment with all the design phases that all my fellow designers know and that we have mapped out in our contract, right? So in the schematic, in the concept, in the schematic design, when we're developing and we're pulling and we're, it's, it's like there, we're not in a box of we can't mix pattern or we do this or, we, or you know, the client doesn't like green, so no green. It's, it's that beginning schematic phase is about, is not about thinking about rules. It's about this huge exploration. Um, then we develop the design and we do the editing and we do the refining and the same thing happens as that, as that happens with the design process and the construction documents, the same thing is happening with the artwork. So is the artwork available? Um, is the one that the client fell in love with available? Did it already sell? And in this market probably already sold if you didn't have it on reserve. So then what else do they have? And does the client love that one as much as the first one? So it's, it's all with, with our practice, it's all happening at the same time. 
Um, rarely is it, we have a wall to fill, let's go find something. I mean, it's usually a, an, a, an integrated process, um, except for some of our clients who maybe already have a designed home and they're looking to layer in artwork that's in, in harmony. Do you ever I love the idea of luck, luck and timing playing <laughs> such a factor as well? <laughs> Absolutely. Do you ever base a room off of an artwork? I, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not sure that I would describe it like that, but I would, I think what you're asking is like, will one artwork inspire everything? Inspire and everything. I, I, think it, I, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, I think that it's, it's very different on every project. I think that, that a, a solid yes to your answer would be in our own exhibition spaces. And so okay. we, we have two galleries in addition to our design studios and in our own exhibition spaces, we are commissioning an, a site specific installation. We are pulling together artists work. And in that case, a hundred percent, that is the basis for the design and how we evolve, how the space is evolved and what is the furniture and, and what is the lighting in that case, a hundred percent. It's totally based and a hundred percent driven by the art. I think in our design projects, it's a little more fluid and it, it's a little unpredictable. <laughs> so, Question, Elena, and this uh, is probably so redundant for all the designers that are listening, but um, with us, we really encourage clients to take artwork and live with it. When you talk about living with art and, and for Peter, unfortunately, you can't wallpaper an entire wall and say, well, go live with it no. in the month of July. <laughs> No. Um, but we can, if it's not something that there's a wait list for, and there's, um, you know, literally um, a, a cat fight to get the piece, then we absolutely encourage that. So I'm curious with both of you all on a technical uh, question, but because I'm not an interior decorator designer, are you using programs now that you present your client? Um, well, this is what your room will look like in the lavender. This is what, and then they get to sit with that all weekend and make those decisions so that couple, would be so nice a couple of things we um certainly for clients that are sort of um have a hard time visualizing space we do three-dimensional renderings and um, in addition to the furniture um and especially when working with pattern i find it really important to illustrate that um to your point i mean we can i mean we can buy we can borrow a large scale sample um, from and showrooms are very generous with loaning a sample, but that's for a day or something. So we yeah. tend to render, you know, pattern, color, all of that, but we also render in artworks. Um, I think if if an artwork is across in another country, we'll render it for scale um, and in proportion with everything else. And then it's if the client feels inspired by that or if that sort of works, then it we'll, pay, we'll pay for the freight and the shipping and the insurance and all of that to have it. But if there's a, a New York area gallery that we have a relationship with, then we take works out on loan all the time. I mean, probably on a monthly basis, we're borrowing works. We're not installing it, but we're just sort of, we've got the gloves on and we're showing the work so that they can see it in person because um, so many people are looking at images and right. they're looking at them quickly also, you know, yep. going through quick, quick, quick. Yes, no, I like it. I don't like it. And missing so much of the detail and the depth. Yeah, and the the depth. There's no way to see all yeah. the layers of the painting, but we're in a, a world where this is also helpful and there's nothing better than to love something on the screen and even love it in person. Sometimes that doesn't. I think, oh, I think I hate also the colors look nothing like it. I'd be curious how Peter. Just um you, you mentioned to convey scale and actually that's so important. Like you know, we um our photography purposefully is is paired back. Um and that's because we kind of want our photography to be able to be given to a range of interior designers where people are not so transfixed by the interior of that particular house because it might not hold relevance to their customer. So, um, so for instance, we're, we're based in the UK, Zofany is, its history is so intertwined with English stately homes. So early photography is all stately homes and it's really difficult if you don't happen to live in a stately home to visualize how big that design is because stately home ceilings are a minimum of four to five six meters high they're ridiculously high so 
um, you look at a design there. So to do a modern rendering, and I think we're living in a world where we are so accustomed to seeing digitized interiors. And so, um, but I, I think we're wise enough to realize it's not going to give you the same impact as walking into that room. So I mm -hmm. think, I think you're, you're enabled to show scale um, and just how everything sits beside one another. It's a fantastic tool for interior designers. Um, mm -hmm. Our job is to really show the product as best we can through photography and through um, how we, we display in our showrooms. And um, the problem is there's a level of tactil tactility to how all of our products, so which photography will never convey. So we've just launched the really lovely wool satin, which is a plain. It's got the most beautiful drape. It, it's like liquid in fabric, um, but the photography doesn't really convey it to the reality of actually going to see it in person and feel there it. There is nothing like touching and feeling. No, and being. no, no. Yeah, nothing. So Blair, I have a question. As a gallerist who has a keen eye, how do you layer artworks like as to, with textiles and wall coverings upon actual pieces of artwork? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Well, I think just like uh, Peter and Elena, you must listen to the client. If everyone's home that we worked with looked the same, I think we'd be in trouble <laughs> because then it would be my, you know, I would be pushing off what I feel. But personally, uh, I happen to be married to a gentleman that more is always better and layers and layers, and he does not throw away anything. We came across some uh, record, you know, records, true records the other day, not even a cassette tape. And I thought, what are we doing with these? I mean, nothing gets thrown away. So if there's ever a period in history we're looking for, open a closet and you will find it. So um, we will always have layer upon layer upon layer in our home. And you've got to sometimes just go with what you um, are working with. So we love um, the artists in our own home might be a little disappointed that they're not in a cold white box. Thankfully, we have a gallery for that. But um, and we actually love to have people over for a cocktail to see how people live with art as opposed to the cold white box. But we just feel confident I guess I have learned so much from Alistair um, about different historical periods dating, you know, just like um, with Zofany that we're looking backwards in our goal to look forwards in our home. And so to honor all these historical periods of, um, you know, Ormolu and um, Chinese lacquer and all these different rich textures, and then to put an emerging or a mid-career painting layered on the top, it is truly nothing more exciting. I mean, it's just absolutely, um, you know, your hair sticks up and you think, wow, it's not too much. And it might be too much for some, but for us, it's literally walking into your own museum and looking at, well, gosh, that was from a trip to India and that was from a trip here and there. So it's really a passport stamp and um, we, never tire and because we move things around so much um we have that uh, ability to do it because art's coming and going it's just nice to never tire but I think as someone that is literally putting that piece for the next 20 years to say love the artwork just as much as you love that fabric and now fabrics mm -hmm. are like artwork so we're not big on buying I mean you can buy for resale and if that's your goal and if that's your jam Love it also though. If you're trying to flip it in a few years, um, make sure you love it because it would be no fun and all the passion is out of it. So I think the bottom line is passion. And the magic is in the mix, I really think. Yes, absolutely. I just wanted to ask Blair a quick question. Um, yeah. Cause I've noticed um, going to see exhibitions in London um, pre-lockdown, but I, I was sure. beginning to notice um, how gallery spaces were being sort of treated. And there was one in particular, which was the Lee Krasner at the um, Barbican in London. And mm -hmm. they had painted the walls in like really sympathetic colors to the artwork, which actually brought everything to life. It looked so beautiful and it was miles away from the white box scenario. Yeah. Um, and I think they even like, juxtaposition the wall so they weren't even at 90 degrees so it just flew really beautifully um 
And I've noticed it happening a couple of times and it's actually quite similar to as if you were to go to a stately home here and sure. you go, go along a picture gallery um, and the colors used on like, you know, like especially like our National Art um, Museum and stuff, the colors are very regal, but they're colors as opposed to white. So it was interesting when you're saying, looking back at how, what framed artwork in the past, and what, Actually, we're how, coming full circle. Yeah. It's full circle. And I think yeah. it's so much to be celebrated because I mm. think there was a time where it had to be cold and it had to um, have this lack of any emotion. And to think that we were layering and going in a different direction meant that it was vapid or meant that it was um, not taken seriously because the work wasn't conceptual enough. Yeah. And now we're looking back and we're pulling from history. You can't deny history, especially these stately homes. And um, there's just something so magical about it. The artist that actually um, is a very um, exciting uh, force of absolute creativity. She's young and is um, in her early twenties and is exhibiting in the gallery right now. I loved what she did. She's very interested in uh, product design and our whole topic collaborations. She created a wallpaper to go behind a painting, similar to what you're talking about, Peter. And um, for an emerging young artist mm. to do that and look so far forward and look back, it was just such a nice blending of the mind. She actually put a chair and created almost a vignette to what felt like home. The title of the show is A Place of My Own and she wanted to turn the gallery into her own home. So yet again, we're back to that conversation of just, I think, breaking those boundaries that an art gallery should be cold and you should literally need a jacket when you walk in. And I think it makes people so much more comfortable when they walk in. Mm. I still have clients that say, will you take me down to Chelsea because I don't feel comfortable. They say the gallerina stare at me like I'm not worthwhile. And that makes me want to be ill. It is mm. so unacceptable because now going out on a Saturday to gallery should be every bit as um, is worthwhile and, um, and re giving you so much um, pleasure as going to the Met because they're of that caliber, but never should you feel uncomfortable. So I say, if you're treated like that, cross it off the list and tell all your friends to never go back <laughs> and keep the nice ones on your list because everyone should be pleasant and it should be a happy experience. So we're nearing the end of our segment, sadly, um, but I wanted to ask one question to each of you. Do you, and maybe you can answer in you know a minute, um, do you have any advice for those listening on how to design a space with art upon art? And is there a certain standpoint, you know, pro Peter from the product side and Blair from the art perspective and Elena from the standpoint of interior design, where you should start with art upon art? Um, I know that that's a loaded question to ask at the end, but if you could just quickly give some advice to our listeners, that would be great. Um, I do. It really depends on how the, what the starting point is for this, but I, I really do think it's that initial um, reaction. I'm always amazed that when I, I see numbers of huge amounts of portfolios, I see huge amounts of designs and qualities. And when something resonates and it's very clear, um, I'm completely amazed how I will never tire of it. Um, mm. And I think that's the key is to find these real anchor points, be it a piece of artwork, be it like, you know, the feel of a, of a particular velvet, uh, the, the feel of a boucle, um, something which reminds you of a holiday, but it's something that is your connection to that. And then everything starts to build around that. And then it becomes something which is very bespoke to you in a way. Um, I love that. I think this is exactly to make it personal. I really do. And have confidence. I think people can be so scared and they come in yeah. and say, say, I have to be careful saying this because they'll say, I love the art in X's home. That's exactly what I want. And so I'm so happy that that um, word of mouth exists. We'd be out of business if it wasn't. But then I say, well, let's talk about what you might love different. Maybe it's the same artist. 
but let's make it personal to you. And I think that honestly stays true to yourself. And as Peter's saying, you will love it for life. Mm -hmm. And obviously you can change around as you go along and we all evolve. But if you truly love a piece of art and truly now with these design pieces being so elevated, you just can't go wrong. Sorry for the D and D that they won't be back. <laughs> they always will. But but to have the confidence and just be brave. Yeah, Elena. The idea would be to venture without judgment. Um, to just put those critiques aside and go with what you respond to and what you sort of feel in your gut. And it's not about right, wrong, good, bad. It's about what feels, what feels good to you. In terms of developing a space with art on art, select a few focal points. What are the, what are the areas? And then what sort of medium best expresses that? So if it's mi mixing a photograph with the work on paper with the painting um, and incorporating that into your space, in conjunction with textiles and wall coverings, then you really start to get somewhere very exciting. Amazing, thank you. So now we're gonna do a little rapid fire. I love to do this at the end of each okay. panel. The panelists don't even know what I'm gonna ask. So it's a little exciting. Um, we're gonna go Peter, Peter Blair and Elena. So I'm gonna say something and, and you have to say the answer, the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay. So the first thing is, if I had to pick one design rule, it would be? <laughs> I said, well, I, I'd go with be brave. <laughs> there you go. Oh, yeah. Blair? Oh, it's the exact same. Oh, the exact same Everybody question. I thought I had a new question. question. <laughs> um, honest. Honest. Be honest with yourself. Elena? Uh, be independent and expressive. <laughs> Great. Next one is my design icon is? Oh, God. Um, oh, God, sorry. Um... Rapid fire. <laughs> Rapid fire, <laughs> sorry. I'll go all of my artists in our program. Okay. <laughs> Um, I, I, I'm actually going to say something a bit weird. Um, Macintosh. I, I find I've just recently fallen in love with Macintosh again. So um. sweet. <laughs> Pioneering creative women. There you go. My one guilty pleasure is. Oh God, my my <laughs> allotment. <laughs> the um, I... margaritas. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh my goodness, that we can move around art all the time because we're in the industry. So that Amazing. will never tire of artwork. Elena? Guilty pleasure? Yeah, what's your guilty pleasure? Oh, my guilty pleasure is when I take my dog Vesper for a walk, I do not take my phone. So you will not read me, I am unplugged. Oh, good. That's, wow. Bravo. <laughs> Uh, my favorite cocktail is, I know Blair, you were about to say margarita, but my favorite cocktail is? Negroni. Mm. Wow, I need the recipe. I have a meeting this afternoon, um, oh, helping a women's, club, a women's club across the street with cocktails. And mine is a ginger margarita. Oh, Throw a chunk of fresh ginger in with your lime juice and your Cointreau and your tequila, voila, it's amazing. And Elena? I'm going to say French 75, hold the simple. Oh, mm. sounds refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> and don't be afraid when the bartender says, but it'll be so bitter. It's not. <laughs> um, my last one is, my favorite color combo is. Ooh. Oh, God. Um, well, at the moment, I've just colored a, de a design and it's got uh, like a lapis and a Chinese yellow combined within a jacquard. Um, and I'm quite loving it at the moment. Wow, I think I'm going with what I have on. Pink, well, red and pink. I think those colors you never, when you were young, would have combined, but I think they work so nicely. Oh, I love kind it. Kind of a hate spade moment, but, um, and it makes you happy. Makes you happy. Elena? Blue and green, as evidenced by our rug in the background. Yeah. And your your top, Elena. Yeah. <laughs> You're in green. 
So we uh-huh. had one um, audience question that was, how do you help your clients figure out scale? It's so easy to mess that up as a client. So if anybody wants to jump in with an answer on this, please do. I think um, we always have a tape measure with us at all times. So it's the phone and the tape measure. Um, So it's constantly pulling out the tape measure showing it's kind of about this, it's kind of like this. Um, In the design process, it's renderings. Um, And then I think also scale is not necessarily size. Scale can also be intensity. So let's not think about art as cost per square foot. Let's think about art in terms of what does it do? Because a painting this big can give maximum effect. I think that's a great answer. We, when we digitally mock up, it's very general. We don't use a program. So sometimes it gets to the client's home and they thought, well, gosh, you know, your digital mock-up looked a little off, but um, we're never that literal. It's just the idea and that's where we want it to be. But um, I think trying things in person when you can is fantastic. And yet again, falling in love with something and if it's a little oversized, so be it. Often we love to put like the piece behind me is, um, is like a mural. And that would be something a little unexpected because it's so big, it's like wallpaper. So that's where Peter and I just take to get together and make sure we're working. (laughs) Um, For for us, we do a combination of photography with products which are nearby, so it gives you scale, but um, we always suggest to actually order a sample or get a returnable. So you really do have the product right in front of you to be able to see the color scale in your own home. uh, We have one more question. Um, Peter Blair and Elena, would you agree that artwork of any kind, whether it be a Zoffany fabric, a sofa, or a wall covering, or a painting, it takes us on a journey. It it is a two-dimensional movie, if you will. And when it's in our homes, it means that we're taken on this journey many times a day every day. And that is why art is such a personal thing because we inherently, we want to go on happy, joyful journeys. So would you agree? I mean, and having said that, are there other ways, um, are there always times when we would rather go on a somber journey, but we would wanna be on a happy journey? So it's asking, are there places that we can go that are not necessarily happy all the time? I think it's a great question. And I tend to try to wake up happy every day. And of course that does not happen, but I think you can look at it room to room, not that you want your um, dark room and your light room, but I think layered in through your home, you might need some Xanax if every single place you look is as happy as this painting, because that's not real life. So I do think to bring in a photograph that, um, that maybe is very, just introspective and thoughtful and um, it makes you question. I love something when you look and you think, what are they doing if it's a figurative piece? And um, so I absolutely think to bring some things in that we, we call it even a palate cleanser that tone down and let us take a breath. And um, unless you are that person that is happy 24 seven and everywhere you look, I think it's a great question that you wanna treat it like real life in their good days and their bad days. So let um, the art reflect that. And the, the sad piece is no less important. It might even be your all time favorite because it back to that being honest, there's your honesty mm. right there, a mirror that you're looking into. I, um, I really love, loved it, sorry. Uh, Elena, when you said how a small piece of artwork could resonate, the impact could be so large. And um, I, I completely agree. I don't think you should be happy in every room. And it's a shame that space is so limited because I'd love the room to match my mood, how I am throughout the day. And, um, and, and, and what you do in these rooms, I love reading and I love to be cocooned when reading and I like to be snug. Um, I love the idea if I had a piece of artwork which was so emotive to almost have one room which I could just read in and have that one artwork and view it on its own with its right colour to show it off at its best. Um, So I think having varieties of um, ups and downs and different levels and also homes are where you entertain as well Um, and you bring the outside people into your personal space and so again, your those areas 
hold a slightly different function. But I think, um, I imagine everyone's gone through the same thing. I've not spent so much time in my own home um, until recently. And it's interesting how you we completely sort of reassessed how we wanted the rooms to work a bit. Um, and that was purely because we, as partners, we've not been in the same property all the time together constantly. And we realized we, we need different spaces at different times where we're, we're not the same person. Well, I think part, part of the beauty of artwork is that it's not necessarily all or nothing. The mm. artwork I have in my own dining room on certain days feels very dark and, and sort of looming. And then on other days feels very joyous and sort of, you know, I'm ready for a road trip or something. So it's like, it just sort of depends on how you are feeling. And I think that speaks to the idea of having a collection of works in your home. So um, we just installed something for a client. She grew up watching boxing with her dad. And so we found for her this Harry Benson photograph of Muhammad Ali. And when we installed it, she cried. Now, does that mean that she's gonna cry every time she sees it? No, but it'll depend on the day, but it's deeply personal and it's something that's moving to her. Um, and we have that across a beautiful wall uh, watercolor that is sort of light and serene and dreamy. And, and I think that's, that's what we're looking to do. That's incredible. How personal. My, our daughter just got her black belt in um, karate and boxing. So that would be so personal and so magical to tell that story through a Harry Benson photograph. That's insane. Yeah, that's amazing. amazing. Well, a big thank you to our audience for tuning in today's, into today's discussion on the intersection of art and design. And a huge thank you to Zofany, Peter, Blair, and Elena for joining us and sharing your all very unique perspectives on this topic. Please be sure to check out the D&D's additional virtual keynote panels later today. My name is Brittany Chevalier McIntyre. Thanks again. See you soon. Bye, Bye guys.